Hi everyone, I have another interesting piece of the jigsaw puzzle at Gebekli Tepe for you, uh, concerning our most important pillar, pillar 43. Now sometimes I'm challenged about my interpretation of Gebekli Tepe, especially I hear the question, how do you know this is the sun? And that these are constellations, and that this pillar encodes a date. Well, usually my answer is that the statistical method I devised to decode this pillar is so strong that it more or less proves it. Now, while that's good enough for me and many others, some people are not convinced by this. They might say, ah, well, that's too subjective. You can't know that. And so I went further to show that the animal symbols in Paleolithic cave art use the same zodiacal system. And the statistical test for that hypothesis was objective, no subjectivity at all, with the result of one in 500 million of being wrong. And that's all published in academic journals. Now, to my mind, this proves my point beyond any reasonable doubt. But even that wasn't good enough for some people who just can't bring themselves to accept this new understanding, which is understandable because it's such a challenging shift in our knowledge it would meet lots of resistance simply because of that, despite the overwhelming evidence. So anyway, back to the question, how do we know this is the sun? Well, actually there's another route to decoding this pillar, a more direct route, which I'll show you now. So we know this is the sun because the people at Gebekli Tepe wrote it down, essentially. See, here is pillar 18, this is a laser scan of pillar 18 and we see up here there's something called uh, a necklace on this pillar and here we've, we've zoomed in to that necklace. And we can see the symbols here. We have what is obviously the sun and the moon together, perhaps symbolising an eclipse, and we have this H symbol. And it's clear that this is an H symbol with a dimple because there are other H symbols further down on this pillar, the so-called belt buckle. And these H symbols don't have dimples. They're the same as this, but without the dimple. So we know that the dimple carries an extra layer of meaning beyond just the moon, the sun and the H symbol. Now I suggest that the H symbols represent the stars or maybe the night sky. And so perhaps the dimple represents or is symbolizing that the sun, the moon and the stars or the night sky were obscured by something, perhaps maybe dust, soot and ash from the Younger Dryas impact. Whatever. What, what really matters here is that these symbols are the moon and the sun. Only I mean, the sun has a, a dimple here for some reason. So now when we go back to pillar 43 and we have the same symbol, Clearly this is the sun. Well, if this is the sun, how does it make sense to have animals surrounding the sun? Well, obviously these are not actual animals. They're symbols for constellations in exactly the same way that we represent constellations with animal symbols. And indeed, if we look at pillar 33 at Gebekli Tepe, we see snakes emanating from the bodies of foxes and birds. And again, this makes no sense if viewed literally, but when we realize that these animals are representing constellations, then the snakes therefore make perfect sense as meteors. It's essentially a picture of a meteor shower, possibly the Taurid meteors. So yes, these animal symbols only really make consistent sense when you view them as constellations. Now the archeologists who work at Gebekli Tepe instead suggested that this might be a skull. And that's because they're obsessed with this idea of a skull cult at Gebekli Tepe, with sky burials and excarnation by vultures. But does this look like a skull to you? It doesn't look like a skull to me. It looks nothing like a skull. It's just a featureless round disc, just like the one on pillar 18. In fact, there's no evidence for any human burials at Gebekli Tepe there are no human remains that have ever been found there. 
So where does this suggestion that this scene represents excarnation by a vulture come from? Well, mostly it's from Çatalhöyük, another Neolithic site in Turkey. Now Çatalhöyük dates from around 7,000 to 6,100 BC or, or, or thereabouts. So it began about a thousand years after Göbekli Tepe was buried. Now in the upper levels of Çatalhöyük are these paintings of vultures together with headless people. And essentially this is the key evidence that archaeologists have interpreted as vulture excarnation. So whenever they see a vulture and a headless man, like we have on Pillar 43 at Gebekli Tepe, what they're actually doing is just comparing that scene with these pictures at Çatalhöyük. But the shrines and paintings at Çatalhöyük are completely consistent with the zodiacal system too. So for example, these vulture paintings in the upper levels of Çatalhöyük were painted around 6300 BC and that is when Sagittarius becomes the autumn equinox constellation. We don't see these vulture paintings before that, they're not in the lower levels of Çatalhöyük at all. So the zodiacal theory not only explains Gebekli Tepe, it also explains Çatalhöyük. It explains why we see the vulture or eagle on pillar 43 and why we don't see them again until we get to the upper levels of Çatalhöyük about 6300 BC. And that's because Sagittarius has changed from being the summer solstice at Gebekli Tepe to the autumn equinox constellation at the end of Çatalhöyük's time. Oh, the conventional view that these are actual vultures and these are actual people doesn't explain this. And look how large these vultures are too compared to their people. They're massive. And we see the same thing with the other animal paintings at Chattelhoek. They're so huge compared to the paintings of people. So it makes no sense to interpret them as actual vultures at all. Clearly they're symbols for something else and they are totally consistent with the zodiacal theory. And here probably they represent the constellation Sagittarius on the autumn equinox. And also, if we look at uh, lower down in the, the levels of Çatalhöyük, we find these bear shrines. And the bear shrines have circles in their bellies. Now, according to our zodiacal theory, the bear represents Virgo, and Virgo is indeed the summer solstice constellation uh, at that time. And so we can interpret, once again, the circle as the sun. So here it's representing the summer solstice just as it represents the summer solstice on pillar 43. So it's obvious that this disc on pillar 43 represents the sun and the animal symbols represent constellations. And anyone who suggests otherwise needs their skull examined. Actually, that's a joke. And then, of course, it's obvious that the scorpion here represents the Scorpius constellation. And as soon as we see the Scorpius constellation, we can expect to find other constellations we are familiar with today. So, for example, down here we find uh, a dog or wolf exactly where we expect to see the, the constellation of Lupus. And up here we expect to find a constellation similar to the Archer. Remember, our modern constellation is of a centaur holding a bow and arrow. The bow and arrow represent the teapot asterism of Sagittarius. And indeed the vulture has exactly the form expected. Now why would you carve a picture of the position of the sun relative to the constellations and then provide three more animal symbols or constellations at the top of the pillar next to what appear to look like uh, sunset symbols? Right? We, we know this is all astronomical, so these are probably sunset symbols. Well, the only reason I know of is that this scene represents a date using precession of the equinoxes. And if the eagle vulture uh, does represent Sagittarius, as we, suggest, as we suggest, specifically the teapot asterism of Sagittarius, then with the sun in this position relative to Sagittarius, the corresponding equinoctial and winter solstice constellations should be Pisces, Gemini, and Virgo. And when we look at these animal symbols, the bending bird does indeed look very much like Pisces. 
and the down crawling quadruped does look like a lot like Virgo and I think this charging ibex does look a bit like Gemini. So everything fits. In other words, where we expect to find animal symbols that resemble our modern constellations, every time we do find them in those positions. And I think these pattern matches are pretty much obvious to most people. Now given the position of the Sun, the date written here is extremely close to the date of the Younger Dryas impact around uh, 10,835 BC. And you can see my other videos for an explanation of how we arrive at that date. Now, some people might argue that the Younger Dryas impact theory is controversial. Some even continue to argue that it never happened. The impact never happened. But that view is out of date. The research evidence is now overwhelming as I show in my other series of videos. And if you want evidence that the impact affected Gebekli Tepe, well, that's easy. First, we have this study at Abu Huraira, about 100 miles south of Gebekli Tepe. And that shows that temperatures in excess of 2000 degrees Celsius must have been present during the burning of that site at a time that coincides within the Arabars with the Younger Dryas impact event. And they know it must have been this hot because they identify minerals in particles from the burned layer at Abu Huraira that have melted and their melting temperatures are hotter than 2000 degrees. Now that is very hot indeed. Only a cosmic impact or lightning can create those kinds of temperatures at Earth's surface at this time. And the authors could rule lightning out. So it has to be a cosmic impact. And then there's this study of five lakes in the region around Quebec Tepe. And these researchers examined the sediments from these lakes. Uh, and in at least two of them, the two lakes in Turkey, so that's Lake Akgol and Lake Van, they found conspicuous layers of charcoal. Essentially, this is likely to be the extension of the Younger Dryas black mat into Turkey. So this is the sediment record for Lake Akgol, and you can see this massive spike in charcoal at a depth of about 280 centimetres in the sediment at the bottom of the lake. And when we look at their radiocarbon age depth model, that corresponds to around uh, 12,790 BP, which is 10,840 BC. And remember, the proposed date of the impact is 10,835 BC to within 50 years. So it agrees perfectly with the estimated date of the uh, Younger Dryas impact. And there's a similar result for Lake Van. Now, the authors of this paper put this charcoal layer down to just regular burning, nothing special. Except, of course, this is the highest abundance of charcoal by far in 12,000 years. And it's pretty much the same for Lake Van. So what do you think? Is this soot and charcoal fallout from the Younger Dryas event? Or are these just regular wildfires that just happen to occur at about the same time in these two different lakes separated by several hundred miles? Especially when we know a cosmic impact destroyed Abu Huraira at exactly the same time. Well, whatever, there is ample support for the idea that the Younger Dryas event, uh, impact event affected the region around Quebec Tepe. Here is Lake Akgol, here is Lake Van, here is Abu Huraira, and Quebec Tepe is right in the middle of that triangle. Anyway, the key message of this video is that we know the circle on Pillar 43 is the sun because the people at Quebec Tepe tell us it is. Here it is next to the moon on the neck of pillar 18 and everything else follows from that simple connection. That's all for now. Take care.